So we said that there are uh, two types that we can classify block ciphers into, SPN and phase style. So let's start with SPN, in other words, substitution permutation network. A round of an SPN consists of three layers, key addition, which combines key material with the plain text, substitution layer, which provides confusion, and permutation layer, which provides diffusion. Block ciphers like AES, or present are examples of SPN, which we are going to be, uh, which we are going to uh, analyze in this course frequently. So I try to draw a picture of what an SPN looks like. So you have the plain text block here. At first layer, initially you have to combine it with the key. So you have the key and the key schedule algorithm, which provides round keys. So you combine your first round key with your plain text block. Most of the time we use simple operations like XOR operation here. Then the actual run starts, which consists of substitution, permutation, and again, a round key. Here, again, this is the confusion layer, this is the permutation layer, and this is the key addition layer. So one round consists of these three layers. You repeat it many times, and at the end, you obtain the cipher text. So, as you can see, uh, initially at, at the beginning and at the end, you have the add round key because if you don't use this layer, for instance, assume that there is no add round key here and uh, you have the ciphertext block here and an adversary captures the ciphertext block, they can uh, go upwards and perform the inverse of the permutation and inverse of the substitution layer. So, they can reach to here. So this means that these layers has no effect. But once you use the round key here, and since the attacker does not know this value, they cannot obtain the value here. So they cannot capture the intermediate values uh, going upwards, or even if they know what the plain text block is, they cannot go forward since they don't know the key. So this is why we are using the Kershaw's principle. We are assuming that all of the details of the encryption algorithm is public, and only secret information is the key. So this is why the attacker cannot capture plain text block from cipher text or intermediate values and so on, or the key. So here's an uh, example for an SPN cipher. Uh, this is present, which is ISO IEC standard for lightweight cryptography. Uh, this standard contains only two block ciphers, present and clavia. So present cipher is really simple. Uh, it is designed for hardware. The block size is 64 bits. And in this picture, each line actually represents a single bit. So there are 64 lines here. Key length is 80 bits or 128 bits. It depends on the user, but uh, the algorithm doesn't change much. The key schedule algorithm is very similar in both cases. So uh, in my opinion, there's no point of using the 8-bit key because you will be losing a lot of security at this point because uh, I believe that it is not that hard to perform brute force attacks for the 8-bit key, which I will be uh, briefly, mention this, briefly mentioning this before the end of this lecture. So you have a key, but here you will be using 64 bits of that key, which is the round key. And uh, you have an S box here. This is uh, actually the confusion layer. You have the same box, uh, which has four bits of input and four bits of output. And you repeat this operation 16 times. And the definition of this box is given here in the hexadecimal notation. So for instance, if the input of this S box is uh, zeros here, so you have zero, 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 this means that in hexadecimal notation, your input is zero. So the output will be C. In the integer notation, this is 12. But in the bit notation, if the rightmost bit is the least significant bit, which is the case most of the time in cryptography, this means that 12 will be represented as one one zero zero. So if your input is all zeros, you end up with one one zero zero. So you repeat this process 16 times. 
So this is your confusion layer because you're substituting some input with some uh, with an output. So you create some confusion here. But as you can see, the these four bits only affect these four bits. So there's not much of a diffusion here. So this is the reason why we have we are having a permutation layer afterwards. So this line saying that this bit goes here, but this bit goes here. And this one goes there and so on. So you're kind of uh, shuffling the places of bits. So this is your just one round. So after the end of this one round, you have 64 bits here. Take it, put it top. Now exhort with the next round key, perform the SBOX operations again, and perform the permutations and so on and so forth. How many times? For this cipher, it is chosen as 31. So take this picture and repeat it 31 times from top to the bottom. And at the end, of course, at the final round key edition. And this is your uh, block cipher present. So this is a very simple uh, and a good example for, for the SPN cipher. Of course, we haven't mentioned the details of the key schedule, but uh, we will be talking about it next week. So we are just trying to see the main idea here. Let's move on to phase style ciphers. These ciphers are introduced by horse phase style. Uh, a round of a phase style network consists of a round function and the swap operation. So the B bits input is divided into two halves. Round function is applied to one half and the, out, the output is exhorted to the other half. And the places of these halves are swapped. Key material is used inside the round function most of the time. So again, I try to draw a picture for you. So the main idea for the general phase that ciphers, you have the plain text block and you divide it into two, so left part and the right part. So you have the key schedule algorithm again. So you have the key which provides round keys. So in a single round, you take the right part and you move it to the left part. Also, you have the right part and have a round function. Here you are performing a substitution and permutation operations so that you provide uh, confusion and diffusion here. And the output is exhort the left part. But the left part becomes the right part for the next round. So each round, one half is not affected, moves to the second round, but the other half is modified and goes to the other half. So this is your swap operation. Here's an example, but this is an example for a generalized phase style network. So instead of two lines, you can see that there are four lines here. So this, this is the picture of the Clefia block cipher, which is again the uh, ISS standard for lightweight cryptography. This cipher has a block size of 128 bits. So each line here actually represents 32 bits of information. So as you can see, the leftmost part, this 32 bits, goes to rightmost part without any effect. But uh, it affects the uh, second line here. And this one goes here without uh, taking any effect on it, but it affects the rightmost part. And it goes here and so on. So you repeat this process many times. Depends on how many runs the cipher is. Generally, in the phase style ciphers, most of the time we don't perform the final swap operation in the final round because uh, that has no cryptographic importance to us. So there is no answer for which one is better. It depends on uh, your application actually. But if you need to compare these two types, let's look at the pros uh, for the phase style ciphers. Encryption algorithm is identical to the decryption algorithm. Only the order of the round keys change. This is important because if we go back to the picture here, for instance, in the encryption part, you have the plain text block. So you follow this picture from top to the bottom. So you have a round function here. So this right part goes inside this function and you have obtained the output. But when you are decrypting, you have the ciphertext parts left and right. This right part also goes to the round function in this way. So the direction of the arrows does not change 
when you are encrypting or decrypting. So this is the uh, pro of the phase test cipher. But this is not for, valid for uh, substitution permutation networks because uh, look at the picture here. Once you're at the top, you are going, the encryption goes in this direction, but the person who is decrypting has the cipher text. So in order to go to from bottom to top, you need the inverses of all of these operations. Uh, a pro for the SPN is a single round affects the whole input. But uh, so these, uh, we will have the inverses of these statements in the cons. For the phase that a single round only affects the half of the input. And for the SPN, decryption procedure requires the inverses of the substitution and permutation layers. So this might take uh, more, uh, I mean, this can produce larger code size if you are performing this operation in software, or this may might mean that you need more gates if you are doing it on a hardware. But of course, uh, this is not always the case because it, this also depends on the mode of operation that you are going to use in the real world. So we haven't talked about mode of operations yet. Uh, but we will be talking about them, I think, two weeks later. So this uh, mean, will mean uh, more sense at that point. Currently, we are focused on B-bit input and B-bit output, but when we are going to be working on larger inputs, like one gigabyte, for instance, we need to talk about mode of operations. And again, this will be uh, in two weeks. Another thing to uh, consider when we are designing a block cipher is that the, the platform that we are going to use these algorithms. And we might maybe divide it into hardware versus software. Uh, hardware implementations can easily work on bits. But since most programming languages focus on bytes, bit operations are more costly on software because Getting the information about the single bit or shifting the bits and so on is not that easy on software, but it is much easier on hardware. Cipher design also determines the number of gates required to perform encryption on hardware. So a number of gates determine the area required. So the cost uh, of this implementation on hardware will depend on your design. So it is important how you design the cipher. So actually for this reason, we have the lightweight cryptography area where uh, you're trying to uh, design secure algorithms, secure encryption algorithms that require less uh, number of gates, let's say, but also you are focusing on the power and energy needs of this algorithm, the latency and throughput and so on. But this is uh, the topic of another course. Actually, I'm teaching it this semester also. So if you're interested, you can watch the uh, videos of that course too, which is available again in this platform. And that course is titled uh, Lightweight Cryptography for the Internet of Things. Code size or required memory is not a big problem for software implementations due to the fast CPUs and large RAM. Again, our uh, desktop computers, laptops, uh, smartphones, or tablets has huge amount of computational power and all of them comes with more than one or two gigabytes of memory. But again, for lightweight cryptography, we have very small devices that has like 64 bytes of memory and so on. So your design should depend on the platform that you are going to use it. Security versus speed is another design consideration. Speed is generally measured as throughput Adding more security measures, for instance, increasing the number of runs increases the security but reduces the speed. Ciphers performing well on hardware or software may not be suitable for constraint devices for RFID systems or sensor networks to, due to the limited memory, battery, or computational power. Hence, we also need lightweight ciphers, ciphers for these kind of platforms. And currently, NIST is. Uh, performing a standardization process. So there's a competition going on. And at the end, one or more uh, lightweight ciphers will be standardized by NIST, which uh, probably will end in two or three years. 
So let's move to uh, probably the most heard uh, encryption algorithm, which is DES, short for Data Encryption Standard. It was designed by IBM in 1970s. It was based on an earlier design by Feistel. In 1976, NSA tweaked the algorithm by changing its S boxes, and uh, after that, it became a standard. So NSA's tweak here is actually a good uh, tweak because this way uh, the cipher becomes more secure. We will talk about it when we are talking about differential cryptanalysis, but NSA also shortens the key of the algorithm. IBM was using uh, algorithms that has key length of 128 bits at the time, but after this tweak, key length became, became 56 bits, which is very short even for that time, which actually allows brute force attacks that we are, that I'm going to mention in a few minutes. So uh, this is why we had to uh, stop using this algorithm in 1990s. So this algorithm is currently known as Data Encryption Algorithm, DEA, since it is no longer a standard. And actually, this is a very important topic. A lot of people still think that this is a standard and it is secure. I know a lot of people still using this algorithm, but it has it provides no security at all. It became useless after 1990s since its short key is susceptible to brute force attacks, which I will mention in a few minutes. So let's look at NSA's involvement. In 1976, NSA tweaked IBM's initial design by changing this S boxes, but they didn't explain to IBM why they made such a change. IBM people analyzed this tweak and they discovered an attack that breaks their initial design and they called it T attack. They shared their discovery with NSA and NSA asked them not to share this knowledge with public for they had known this attack type for some time and were using it to listen other countries. And uh, Biham and Shamir's rediscovery of differential cryptanalysis in 1990s is the first public announcement of this technique. And later on, uh, we learned that even uh, Japanese people even knew it during the Second World War, uh, this technique. They were using this kind of techniques in the Second World War. But uh, every country kept this information to themselves. So Biham and Shamir's discovery of differential cryptanalysis was the first public announcement of this technique. Actually, Biham received a, a fellowship from IACR. Uh, International Association of Cryptographic Research a few years ago. And during his keynote speech, he thanked all of the secret services who has known this technique and kept it to themselves so that Biham and Shamir can uh, present it for the first time publicly. Main idea in differential cryptanalysis is to find a weakness so that a small change in the input provides an anticipated change in the output with high probability. And we will be actually talking about this uh, in the week that we are talking about cryptanalysis. So the main picture of uh, this is as follows. You have the key and key schedule algorithm, which only contains permutations and rotations. And uh, as I told you, the, this is a phase style cipher. You have left and right part. You have an initial permutation, which, is, which has no cryptographic importance. It is just used for the, receiving the data from the hardware in a, a good way, let's say. So you have some functions like expansion and so on, and you have here S boxes and the permutation. So you have 16 rounds for this. So what should be the key size? This is a good question. Uh, an attacker that captures a single cipher text can try to decrypt it with every possible key to check if it is if it provides a meaningful plain text. Such an attack is called exhaustive search or brute force attack. So this uh, attack does not use any weakness in the design. So it is just a brute force attack by trying every possible key. Exhaustive search is a generic attack. In other words, valid for every cipher. 
For a key bit key cipher, the attacker is required to perform at most 2K encryptions and decryptions, or decryptions, sorry. So, I mean, you can capture a plain text block and perform the brute force attacks, but most of the time, most probably you will get a plain text block and a corresponding cipher text block. So all you need to do is to perform two to the K encryptions and check if the cipher text you obtained is the same as the one you captured. The security of a block cipher is upper bounded by exhaustive search attack, which is two to the K encryptions. So this quantity is referred to as time complexity. So you can break every cipher with two to the K encryptions. So any weakness that you find that makes it easier to break the cipher that requires less than two to the K encryptions is a uh, cryptanalysis attack actually, so which, is, which would be better than brute force. So let's look at the security of this. Biham and Shamir provided the first theoretical attack in 1992, the differential cryptanalysis. But this required, uh, this was better than exhaustive search, but however, the attack required two to the four to seven chosen plain text to be captured, which is actually unrealistic in real life. So, Attack wasn't that successful as expected because of the NSA's tweak of the S boxes. Massey provided the first experimental cryptanalysis of this by introducing linear cryptanalysis. And in 1997, a DES child project, which is around seven to 8,000 pieces connected by the internet, breaks a message encrypted with DES for the first time in public. In 1998, EFF's desk cracker, which is a machine containing uh, around 2,000 custom chips, which can break a desk key in uh, 56 hours, and so, which is very practical. So in 1999, this is only allowed in legacy systems, and uh, a transition to triple desk, which is just using the desk algorithm three times, uh, is suggested. So. But uh, th at those times, a competition is made, and which was called Advanced Encryption Competition. And the winner of that competition become, became the Advanced Encryption Standard, AES, in short. And uh, we always encourage people to use AES instead of triple does. So AES is Advanced Encryption Standard. Uh, the original name of the algorithm is Raindow, but uh, which was designed by John Damon and Vincent Raymond. Uh, it was one of the finalists together with Serpent, Two Fish, RC6, and Mars. But Raindow won the competition, so it is now known as the AES, Advanced Encryption Standard. This time the key lengths are uh, longer than or larger than uh, this. You have three options, 128, 192, and 256 bits. Again, as I told you, this is good for personal security. This is good for military use. And as far as I know, no one uses this uh, middle value. Uh, but depending on the ch choice of the key length, the number of rounds changes. So if you are using a longer key, the number of rounds also increases. So you obtain like you get a performance drop uh, like from 10 rounds to 14 rounds. So you get like 40% of extra uh, computation. Block size is larger, 128 bits. There are many cryptanalysis results on AES, but uh, none of the known attacks are effective. So we believe that AES is secure to use. So why are we interested in this key length? So if you look at two to the 56, which is the size of the possible keys for the DES, the number is this. And for present, if you are using 80-bit key, this is the number of possible keys. And for AES-128, it is this. For 192-bit key, it is this. And for 256 bits, it is this. Since this is an exponential increase, uh, even if a technological breakthrough happens and somebody can break 
AES 100 and 28 in a single second, which means that you can perform two to the 128 AES encryptions in one second, such a uh, person would not be able to break AES uh, 256 because if you can perform this many operations in a second, this means that and in a year there is around two to the 27 seconds. So this would mean that you need two to the 100 years to break AES 256 and two to the 100 years is way longer than a, a human lifetime. So how like, can we perform these exhaustive search attacks? Uh, you can use CPUs. We have uh, everybody they have nowadays a desktop or laptop computer. So these are the easiest computational devices that we can obtain. GPUs, which were mainly used for gaming, today is very good for uh, scientific computing. Parallelizable algorithms becomes faster compared to CPUs. Depending on the algorithm, you can get a speed of uh, up to 10 or 100 times. It depends on the GPU and the algorithm. We, you can also use FPGAs, field programmable gate arrays for exhaustive search. Or you can use ASICs, which are dedicated hardwares. These can only perform the implemented algorithm, but they are cost effective compared to the FPGAs or any other devices in the list. So I just uh, uh, calculated the performance of my CPUs and GPUs for, uh, for a brute force attack on present 80. So a very old computer, a laptop computer has four cores, as you can see here, which has clocked as two gigahertz. By using this laptop from 2010, I can perform 15 million uh, present encryptions in a second. So in order to perform two to the eight encryptions, I need this many years for this laptop to, to run itself. And for a desktop computer from those times, the clock speed is higher, so you can perform uh, twice more encryptions in a second. So it will take this many years for this uh, CPU to break uh, present eight. But if you look at the GPUs, this, Laptop from 2010 has a GPU which has 96 cores. So as you can see, even from those dates, GPUs were faster than CPUs for when you're doing uh, parallel computations. But if you use a, again, old but uh, a good GPU, which has 1,664 cores, and nowadays we have GPUs that has more than 3000 cores and clock as two gigahertz. But even for this GPU, you need 84 million years. But again, with a modern GPU, you can reduce this number to actually 10 million years. And you might say that still you cannot break it. 10 million years is a long time. But this means that if video gamers on the internet decides to break present instead of playing a video game, they can break uh, present by a brute force attacks in, a, in some days. So for this reason, I never suggest use of 8-bit keys for security, because even if video gamers can gather around on the internet and break the cipher, secrecy services can perform very much uh, large number of encryptions and with dedicated devices you can actually perform 80-bit brute force attacks in a few days. <laughs>